All righty, y'all. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. How are y'all? I'm missing the earring, so I'm going to take one off. <laughs> um, it's good to be with y'all tonight. Uh, um, it has been a, a couple months since I have gone live to answer questions, and I'm so glad to be back. Um, a lot has occurred between now and then, and um, uh, there's many up VA updates and the questions I know you have, so I'm happy to be here. My name is Carmela George. For those that are new, I am um, a VA accredited claims agent. That basically means that I um, am individually accredited by the VA to uh, present, pursue, and prosecute um, claims, veterans' claims. So I individually represent veterans. Um, I know you're going to ask, so I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. I'm not currently accepting new clients, and I won't be for a while because I'm at capacity. Um, but I do have some referrals on my website. But I'm just here to help as many veterans as possible for um, uh, maybe an hour or so. I know that I'm a little bit late. Y'all won't believe this. I know it's a new year, but I forgot it was the first Thursday of the month. It, like it slipped my mind. And so um, until today or last night or sometime. So I am um, generally on around six or seven or something like that. But I'm, I'm a little later tonight. But it looks like we got a good crowd. So I'm happy to be with you. Um, let's get this started. Tell me where y'all from. Tell me where you're from, where you're viewing from tonight. We got, let's see. Uh, Washington State. Hey, Mr. Chris, how you doing? I'm so stoked to have made it here. I'm stoked to be on too. I'm stoked to be back with you. Um, and uh, being able to answer questions and help veterans is always a good thing. Let's see. Chi-Town. Hello from Chi-Town. I've got to get there soon. Chi-Town's on my bucket list. Let's see. Maryland. Uh, Phoenix. Kentucky. We're all over the country. We're all over the country. Wow. I'm always amazed at the, the sheer uh, geography that we cover. Um, Oklahoma. Washington. Virginia. Orlando. Hey, hey Miss Curry, how you doing? Virginia. Oh, man, we're all over the country now. I see, just quickly, I see Mississippi, Arkansas, Virginia, Denver, Chicago, Hawaii. I was just in Honolulu a couple months ago. Saudi Arabia, whoa. We're international people. We're international. That's amazing. Saudi Arabia, wow. Houston, Texas. Goodness, D.C. I'm amazed. I really asked you this question not to parlay um, or take up time, but just to see where we where we cover and i'm amazed all the way from guam that's a long flight i tell you i made that flight a couple months ago and that was a long flight oh boy so let's jump right into it um we have we pretty much have you know the whole country represented that's a great thing let's um we already have some questions so the way this works is um you just type in a question in the comments i'm able to see it on my side and i will answer as many of them as i can get to in an hour um, I tend to try to answer a question as thorough as possible. So I, I, it's likely I won't get to every question tonight um, uh, that comes my way. Um, but I'm going to try to answer the questions I do answer um, in, the, in, a, in a, as thoroughly as possible so you get the best uh, educational claims and can apply the principles that I'm talking about to your claim, possibly, um, and that type of thing. So let's go. Here we go. Saying, hey, all the way from NC. Hey, I'm from North Carolina too, 910, Camp Lejeune. Saying, hey, all the way from NC and ready for the information. With 100% PNT, are you still able to work a full-time job or would it have to be a set amount of hours? Um, but if you are 100% PNT, otherwise known as permanent in total, you can work... Um, a full-time job, there is basically, there's no income restriction. You can own a business, 
you have a, a side hustle, a gig, you can uh, work a full-time job, you can do whatever you want to do because there is no longer, there is no VA oversight or checking up on where you're working or if you're working or that type of thing. Um, that is if you're 100% PMT, 100% permanent and total. If you are 100% unemployable, there is an income restriction, uh, which I believe is set at the property limit. It's about around $13,000, not that exactly, might be a little bit higher now with um, cost of living increase and stuff like that. But um, generally it's around the property limit. It's not very much money that you can make a year and they do review that. But that is um, unemployability, TD, also known as TDIU or IU, individual unemployability, total disability, un individual unemployability. Uh, that, those are the only situations where you would uh, have an income restriction, right? And you have to specifically apply, fill out a form that you want to be or are applying for claiming unemployability. They are not just going to assign it to your rating. It, they, they cannot rate you for as unemployable if you do not fill out the form. You know, the, all claims must be on a prescribed form these days. And so if you have not filled out the IU form and returned it to the VA, uh, you are not un deemed unemployable and um, you don't have an income restriction with any level of rating that you have, 100%, 90%, 70%. Um, as long as you aren't deemed unemployable, there's no income restriction. Hope that helped, Mr. Champ. Okay. Happy New Year to y'all too. I think I forgot to say that. Happy New Year. Cheers. Hope y'all had a good time for the holidays. Okay, I'm 100% PMT. VA says they will be reviewing my TBI in 2025 as there is likelihood of improvement. Oh my God. Thought all my disability is static if I'm PMT, I'm told every other thing is static. What do I do? So um, it's either one way or the other. Either everything is static or something is not causing the exam. You need to get a hold of your rating code sheet. Um, uh, hopefully your representative and that uh, your representative can pull that for you or you need to request it from the VA. Just call and just ask, you know, uh, plead that they just send you that individual sheet that shows your ratings but yeah i mean the next exam isn't until 2025 you've got two years to get it so you just you could just request it the regular way but you really need to look on that sheet and see which disabilities are listed as static and which are not it sounds like the tbi might be the only thing that's listed as likelihood of improving or um non-static and if that is the case if there is a disability on your code sheet that is not um static that would mean that you're not PMT, you're just 100% scheduler. If everything on that rating code sheet, uh, y'all forgive me, I'm a little tired, so my eyes, I'm scorching my eyes. But anyway, um, if everything on that rating code sheet says um, that you're static, that every condition is listed as static, then they've made an error by scheduling a future exam because you are permanent in total and you need to, uh, basically bring it to the VA's attention or have your um, your representative bring it to their attention as soon as possible so that exam can be scheduled and um, there's no possibility of reduction or anything like that. So um, yes, um, that's something you certainly need to look into and look into soon. All right, Mr. Chris, diagnosed with hacial, uh, hernia hacial at 0%, but the decision letter says diagnosis name is different than the CFR of diabolical pain with food dysphagia. It's worsened. Can I file for an increase even though the diagnosis, the diagnosis is named different? Okay, so this is um, an interesting question. It's a little more involved probably than you think, but I think the answer is yes. The way I would approach it is whatever is listed on the rating code sheet or the rating decision as the name of your condition. I would claim that with the um, with um, whatever else is named secondary. That way, everything is covered because um, it sounds like there is um, you you're rated for a hernia, but decision letter. 
decision letter says name is different than the CFR. I can't delineate which one is the name of the condition you're rated for. So you might want to clarify that for me. But whichever, because if it's the hernia, then you need to claim the pain and the food dysphagia secondary. Or if it's the uh, abdominal pain and the um, dysphagia, then you need to claim the hernia secondary. Either way, I, I'm not, it is my opinion, I'm not a medical professional now. I'm going off experience here. It is my um, belief that they're not this, exactly the same condition. And so um, you want to also pay attention to the rating code sheet and the diagnostic code that it's coded under. Would the ask, ask yourself or ask your representative, would the abdominal pain and the food dysphagia be, the, be rated under the same diagnostic code as, as a hernia as a hernia? um 7346 if it would you should be good just put in for an increase if it's not you want to claim it uh by the new name or secondary so yes yes you can always file for increase uh file for increase or file it secondary either way would get you it's the same body system so the rating is going to be they're either going to change the name and rate you at a higher level or they're going to keep it the same so um if the if the diagnosis has progressed or changed or worsened so Hope that helps. Let's see here. Dang, Las Vegas, Honolulu, South Carolina, Missouri, Texas, Alabama, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Wow. Hey, Brian. That's my fellow admin. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Um, St. Augustine, Florida. Wow. California. Ohio, goodness, I'm trying to get to the question, but it's paradise on Guam. Yes, it is paradise on Guam. <laughs> I have an HLR for a denied headache claim secondary to tinnitus. My original claim had a solid nexus by a PA with audiology credentials, a diagnosis by the VA, current symptoms, and my migraine law. Thoughts on this being favorable at the HLR? Um, it sounds like you have a very good chance of it being favorable at the HLR, but you've got to do your work or have your representative do the work. Um, if if you're not represented, I would I would um, suggest that you might submit a written argument detailing all the evidence that is favorable to your claim. Um, maybe maybe put it on a chart, you know, a little table with two columns. This is what is favorable to me in my file, and maybe this is what isn't. The, the, and just, it sounds like the evidence, I say that because, and in this specific case, it might not help everybody, but helping them visually see that the weight of the, the most of the evidence, the preponderance of the evidence in legal speak is in your favor, it's for you, and thus the claim should have been granted, um, or either the benefit of the doubt should have been applied if there was, you know, just one negative opinion and one positive opinion, and they were both credible, adequate, adequate medical opinions and exams. Uh, but it sounds like you submitted exactly what you needed to submit. Um, and and um, I, I see a lot these days where um, raiders are, frontline raiders are saying that the VA's opinion is more persuasive and it's just simply not. Um, it's just a couple sentences where you have like a two or three page nexus from a private provider, your own treating provider. Um, and it's, it's just, it seems to be a tint of bias to it towards the VA in the VA's favor. And so um, remember, sometimes not all raiders, but some raiders are looking at things through VA colored glasses. And um, instead of uh, veteran benefit of the doubt colored glasses. And so we have to, when we have the opportunity, and that's basically what an HLR is, if you have an informal conference, it's an opportunity to have a conversation with the decision maker. The person who's responsible for making a decision on that on that higher level review and so take every opportunity to make things as simple as pie for that reviewer connect the dots don't just get on the phone and have a conversation submit a written argument a written brief of your case uh, detailing the highlights of your case the evidence that's for you and the law that should apply to your case um, that would be helpful and would probably bring home the win
I filed for IBS secondary to PTSD. I had a DBQ and Nexus. I went to the CMP exam and the examiner said not service connected, but VA placed it as deferred and said they are waiting for the PAC Act to make a decision. Do you know why they are doing this? Um, it, um, there's a, there's a, could be a couple of different reasons why they're doing that. It could be that, um, well, one of the reasons they are doing that is because whoever reviewed the claim did not, um, in their discretion, did not see, under, um, did, did not see a way they could rate it under a different theory of service connection other than presumptive service connection. It does not mean that it's automatically going to get rated, but I believe it's, it's probably a good sign. Um, it, it, either they're going to send it for a third exam, maybe, because they, if they were just going to deny, there was no reason to defer. Um, if they were just going to outright deny the claim, except that, well, I guess the guidance tells them, the PAC that guidance told them to hold claims until the first. But um, you have a positive opinion in your favor and you have the VA opinion that's negative. If they're both adequate and credible opinions, oftentimes the VA exam is not credible. The private exam or the treater and provider exam is more thorough than the VA's exam, yet it still gets weighed more or weighed higher. Uh, but, um, you know, given given that both exams are equal, you should win. The, 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 law, the case law says the, uh, the ball goes to the runner, tie goes to the runner. And so in that case, that's the veteran. Um, and um, you might just want to submit a statement, you know, with a couple different laws or M21 provisions that should apply to your case, given that it's under it. Now it falls under the pact that as IBS is presumptive and you have a supporting a positive nexus of record that you submitted. Um, those are all you've met all the elements of service connection. And I would just make that simple, plain in writing, you know, in the file for the decision maker, whether or not the VA opinion was negative or not, there's enough evidence to grant. Um, and that's the way it needs to be viewed. When there is enough evidence to grant, when the elements of service connection have been met and the, the evidence is either in equipose or in a uh, preponderance of evidence in your favor, the claim should be granted. So, um, you know, you just might want to highlight that. Take every advantage you can to do the work and win your claim before before it's possibly denied. So, my claims were filed as primary, but should have been submitted as secondary. How can I fix this? Is there a certain form I need to submit? The the um, the defining variable in that situation would be whether the um, the claims that you submit to submit as secondary have been denied before. If any of those claims or conditions have been denied on their own before, um, then they would need, be, need to be submitted as a supplemental claim, a 0995. The secondary claim would have to be supplemental if the condition has been denied at any point before, whether it was primary or secondary. If you were previously denied um, your hips, let's say that, and now you're claiming, you're going back to claim that your hips are secondary to your back, hip pain secondary to back pain, which I often see, um, then you would have to claim the hips on a supplemental claim form because they've been denied before, right? But if you've never claimed the hips before, then it goes on the original claim form, hips secondary to back, 521, uh, 526EZ form, the original form for benefits. So basically, if it's been denied before, it's a supplemental claim, 20-0995 form. If it's not been denied before, it's the first time you're claiming that condition, even if it's secondary. You need to clearly write that as secondary on the claim form. Um, sometimes the questions they ask on VA.gov can be confusing in the way you're, claim, you're claiming things. I always encourage that if you get confused by what... Uh, what secondary they could it, it would be easy if they just said are you claiming something secondary but they don't they ask it a funny way so if you ever you get confused by which option to choose a secondary just get the paper claim form write a type or write uh hip secondary to back out on the form and 
um, uploaded the quick submit. You know, our um, fax it or mail it in. Uh, quick submit is fastest. The new program to uh, upload documents to you, to your client. So upload it to quick submit and um, you're good to go. It will take a couple of days to show up online when you do the paper form or uh, paper forms. Um, generally, that's what I do. I don't use the electronic system anymore. Um, I use I, I send forms in by API or quick submit. But um, yes, you want to, if it's been denied, it's the supplemental claim form. If it's new, it's the original form. So uh, make, if you don't get the right form, they're just going to reject it. Like you said, if it's not direct and you claim it as primary, it's just going to get denied. And so you want to fix that as soon as possible. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, folks. Okay, we got Detroit. Let's see. Hello from Michigan. Why do veterans have a, such a hard time with LHI in terms of scheduling CMP exams once they are supposed to contact you and how long should it take to hear from them? Um. <clears throat> Whoa, that's a loaded question there, in my opinion. Because I'm just going to be honest with y'all. And um, this is Carmela's opinion, personal opinion. It's not any VA standards. Not, I don't represent, I'm not a representative of the VA. I don't work for the government. And so um, this is Carmela's opinion of a private company. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of LHI as a contractor. You know, I think they kind of rank out as a, at the bottom of exam contractors with the VA. But, um, you know, I hear a whole host of issues all the time as an advocate. And, um, you know, I have my concerns. But um, uh, if there's scheduling issues, the way, the way I like to do things as an advocate is to keep a paper trail and a documentation. If you feel like something strange has happened or something weird has happened, write a quick note, upload it to your claim about what occurred. I tried to schedule the exams. Or I haven't heard. I held, I heard from LHI eight weeks ago, and they haven't contacted me back. They said they would contact me to schedule the date. Um, if something strange is going on, document it and upload it to the file. That way, if funny business goes on, um, and I'm not talking about anything that's wrong. I'm just talking about if you know they say the veteran didn't report for the exam, or I, we couldn't contact the veteran. Your side of the story is documented. There's also a function that started. About a year ago, um, uh, where you can electronically message the VA on askva.gov. It's either askva.gov or ask.va.gov. It's one of those. Let me let me get just, uh, put it in so I can give you all the right address. But anyway, you can go on askva.gov, ask.va.gov, and um, uh, just submit you know a note real quick and and. and uh, specifically ask that they add it to your claims file, the note that you're sending. And, um, you know, it'll be notated that, you know, I haven't heard from LHI or they wouldn't reschedule my exam or I needed to reschedule because I had to work or there was a death in my family. I could not make the date that they give me. They would not give me any options to attend besides this week. If there are scheduling issues, document the problem and upload it to your claims file or get it get it put in your claims file because you don't want that to be used against you and have and have the claim denied because of, because of a simple scheduling issue or a difficult contractor you know that's I don't think that's fair so um just make sure your side of the story your perspective your your um approach to your claim is always clear in your file um and um your advocate could help you with that or can help you with that um if you're represented. All right. Is the annual visit with the VA enough for disability compensation? Compensation disability. How and what do you do to get to PNT? Okay, so this is um this is a um good question, but it, it, it would be a very long answer. Um you you should visit well, I would encourage, I can't tell you to visit the doctor every year. I would encourage you, um, and when, as an approach to your claim, and as primarily, not even about a claim, as an approach to your health, to visit the doctor as often as you need to, to bring some relief to your condition or, you know, to get your condition treated. 
Um, that might be that you're going twice, um, you know, every two months, quarterly, a year, whatever you need to get that. And especially what well, matters in terms of the claim is that the condition is documented currently um, and, you know, throughout time. Um, especially for the documentation portions of it, it's important to visit the doctor um, or, or, or um, visit telehealth or, you know, something. Um, sidebar, I had a, I'm going to answer your question, but I had a, I just had a client who got to 100% and he was deathly afraid of doctors. A lot of anxiety came to me and he said, Miss George, I start sweating. I freak out. I had a bad experience with a doctor before and I just don't like doctors. I can't stand doctors. And that's why um, I really need the resources. I'm, I'm really disabled. My, my disabilities really affect me and are causing more disabilities. But I um, have issues or anxiety, you know, panic, panic attacks basically around medical professionals or sitting in a room, but with the medical professional. And, um, you know, I understood exactly where he was, was saying it's a real phobia or, or condition and, and a problem. And it, it was preventing him from putting it, wanting to put in another claim when he needed the resources to support his family because he can't hardly work. I mean, it was a, it was quite a pickle. So my suggestion to him was uh, let's set up a telehealth visit. We set him up with Teledoc, the telehealth company, where you don't have to physically be in a space with the doctor. Even though it was a joint issue, I, I told him, my advice to him was explain to the medical professional your, your anxiety and issue with doctors in the beginning and that it would be quite a trial and tribulation for you to get seen in person for your joint issues. And the provider listened to him. They, um, they not, not only treated him and prescribed medication, but um, you know, his, he got his current condition documented to the point where we were able to submit the claim for increase and secondary claims and get it, um, you know, service connected. So, you know, sometimes there are different ways to, to, to be treated. You know, um, if the only thing you have is VA care, um, you know, take advantage of that. It might be that more than one visit a year, if you're still in the claims process, could help you um, 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 and show the severity, the real severity of the condition, which is what your rated your rating is based on. Um, but um, the VA do know that the VA also recently, I think it was 2020, 2021, the Mission Act passed. You uh, every veteran um, that's eligible and and uh, enrolled in VA healthcare has access to three free urgent care visits a year under the Mission Act that the VA pays for. There is some urgent care designated in your community or close to you, probably within an hour, you know, time, hours time. I can't speak for every rural area in America or, or you know, across seas, but there are there are now um, hundreds of urgent cares designated as um, places that veterans can get to quickly and get seen for that the VA pays for at no cost to you out of pocket three times a year. There's a site um, to look that up and put your zip code in to see what urgent care is in your community. But it's an alternative to, you know, if you have issues with going to the VA, if they can't get you an appointment fast enough, if something's urgent and, that, you know, you, you can't get to the ER, it's a possibility for you to go in and get seen quickly and get your situation documented and treated, um, you know, and those records can be used in a disability claim. So um, the question, the first question is, is the an annual visit with the, VA with the VA enough for disability compensation? The answer is yes. One visit might do it. One visit might be enough compensation. I mean, might be enough to, to grant, to prove, uh, get a diagnosis, prove a current condition, and prove one element of, of, of what's needed for service connection. What if the other things have, if you've been every year, then it, it chose chronicity and it happened in service, you know, there was an event in service. And so, um, you know, those are the elements of service connection. One visit could do it. The question is, and I think the strategic approach should be, um, is that is the minimum enough? I mean, is the minimum 
going to benefit me most. Does that make sense? Um, is the is the is um a, a one visit a year I think would be considered a minimal, you know um, to, you know treatment for a condition. So that that's you know varies by persons. That's a, my opinion, but um, you know would 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 one visit help you most, or would three or four visits for the condition help you most? You see what I'm saying? So um, that would be my consideration on that question. You really have to answer it for yourself. Is it enough? It could get you it just because it's documented and you have a current diagnosis, it could be enough or, you know, more might be more helpful to you. But how and what do you do to get to PNT? So um, the first thing you have to do to get PNT is be 100 percent unless you're unemployable, deemed unemployable. You apply for unemployability, you get it and they assign permanent and total. So you can get it by getting to 100 percent scheduler or you can get it to by um by um you can get it by tdiu and so the the guidance in the manual and i'm paraphrasing greatly here loosely here says uh basically you know grant pnt when a veteran reaches 100 percent unless there's some compelling reason not to um it says that in so many words um you might get a different interpretation when you read it but that's basically how i consider it that means permanent and total is largely and by far in the raider's discretion the decision maker on your claim um uh, it's not the it's not the examiner's decision it's not the medical professional's decision it's the legal professional's decision the raider it's a legal question is your um uh, disability permanent and total or is there do they do the, the raider have a compelling reason to believe is there some evidence that there might be future improvement in your um in your file and so um you know what do you do to get a pnt um you just you show you have to your doc your documents have to they tell a story they form an image they form a picture if that picture looks like it's going to um not improve um, you're likely going to get granted PNT. It was a condition that has waxed and waned and gotten better, gotten worse, that type of thing. Um, you know, then it's probably, it might not be granted PNT. What's true is in the overwhelming majority of cases that come across my desk, and I've served, you know, over thousands of veterans, um, are seeing thousands of records, basically, thousands and thousands of records. Um, what's true is that most cases get granted PNT if you get to 100%. The um, cases that just get 100% scheduler are the outliers. I don't know what the exact statistics are. That's actually an interesting thought, and I want to look more into that and find out what the, the percentage of people that get PNT versus get scheduler is. That's a very good question. And I would like to be able to tell you all the exact numbers. But from my, um, my, the, my experience, what I see, it's probably about a 80 20 split most people most raiders assign it with the rating because in their discretion your condition is not improved especially if it's worsened and it's you know the condition is increasing that type of thing or you've had the you've had the condition for a long extended period of time you know that would indicate that it's probably not getting better so um there are those cases though that look you know appear that they will get approved one such situation where i see PNT not assigned so much is um, where 100% rating for mental health itself is given. So at the exam, the examiner marks all the boxes that says the veteran is uh, totally impaired by their mental health. A lot of examiners look at that like uh, a lot of raters, and what I'm saying, I shouldn't say a lot, I shouldn't quantify it like that. Some raters look at it like, um, like, you know, that is a situation that could get better just because it's mental health and it's sort of invisible, right? But, um, you know, that's not necessarily the case. We know that that mental health can be debilitating. You know, it can be crippling to life. So um, you um, that's where personal statements help and the full picture of your disability and things like that. So I always tell your side of the story, what do you do to get the PNT? Um, you know, present a case that doesn't appear that it will improve or, you know, um, you know, get the treatment and, and the documents will show that over time it hasn't improved. 
and you should be granted PNT. The greater likelihood is that you will anyway. So, okay. From Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, I have a upcoming CMP exam for PTSD MST. Thank you for what you do. Okay, so um, I wish you the best at your exam. Um, those are always difficult. My first piece of advice is to, um, you know, plan something afterwards where you can just get a release, go to your happy place, grab some lunch, do something to decompress because you're going to have to tell your story at the exam, especially if this is a claim for service connection and an eye increase. Sometimes you don't have to get into the details if it's just a claim for increase because you're already service connected. But if you're claiming for service connection um, and a service connection hasn't been granted yet, you're going to have to tell your story. So plan something to, to decompress afterwards. Be ready to tell your story. Know your story code, uh, forwards and backwards. And, um, you know, you want to pre present it in an authentic way. You don't want to um, tell this, you tell, give the, the details and, and um, you know, what what matters for service connection is the event in service that it happened and how it affected you, it affects you today. Uh, what matters for the level of rating is the severity of the condition. So you've got to cover all that ground. Um, de describe the trauma, the details of the trauma, and then describe how bad it's affecting you today. So make sure you do both parts. Um, what practical examples of how it's affecting you today, I, um, I, get, I get aggressive, I get irritated, I'm in a bad mood often, I have nightmares often. I mean, just, uh, you know, the things that affect you, you want to give practical examples of how it's affecting your life and your work every day. And um, that will determine the level of you get rated at. But um, yeah, just be prepared to tell your story. And um, there's a little bit more I would share with a client, but generally that's the advice I would give to the masses. You know, know your story well, because it's the truth. You know, people just, I don't think people claim MST just to, you know, get disability. When you have gone through something like that, it's a traumatic situation. So, and you know, make sure, um, you know, they understand that how the details have affected you and how it still affects you. Um, working on a claim secondary to other conditions, do I need a nexus? They are so expensive. It, um, that is a, I would have to see the facts of the file to give you an exact answer in your case, Ms. Lopez. But um, generally, second, the, if the secondary conditions have never been claimed or denied before, you can claim them secondary without a nexus. If you have medical records that show you have the condition or you're, that you actually have the condition currently, you know, and you believe it would be diagnosed on CMP exam, then you should go ahead and file the secondary conditions. The nexus is not... Ne a necessity is not absolutely necessary because you're going to likely get a CMP exam and that they can provide a, a positive medical opinion at a CMP exam will get you service connected. And so the way to, um, sorry, y'all, I'm not feeling all that great, but the way to, um, the way to get a disability service connected Secondarily, without a nexus, is to make sure you submit a personal statement of how, with the claim, up front, at the time you press the button to submit the claim, the statement should be of record. Don't submit it after you submit the claim because they might deny it before you get a chance to submit it. Submit a personal statement with the claim with how that primary condition is, you, your theory of how that primary condition is causing that secondary condition and how it affects you every day. The what the guidance says is the um, the radar guidance and the law says that the ever is it's a um, low evidentiary threshold to meet in order to trigger the duty to assist where which the VA should provide an exam. And so that's what you want to get out of it, right? You want to file the claim as secondary, not having a nexus, and you want to get an exam out of it. You want to get a chance for the examiner to see you, diagnose it, or give a medical opinion. And so, um, you know, you it says the guidance for the raters at the regional offices says 
there has to be more than a generalized statement of the connection or association in the file, you know, to meet the, the um, evidentiary threshold of the duty to, to trigger the duty to assist. So um, you can't just say my, um, my back caused my hips to hurt or my tinnitus causes me to have headaches. You can't just write the claim out. You have to tell them how it, um, what well, you were saying secondarily, but you have to tell them how it affects you every day and that it's having an impact on you. And um, you believe that it's, you know, it's caused by that, you know, it's caused by that primary condition. So, you know, um, just write a couple sentences of the connection and how it's connected and submit that with the claim. And you should get an exam without a nexus uh, per the M21. So um, where people go wrong without a nexus on secondary claims, is not submitting a personal statement or connecting the dots to the radar, how you think it's connected. I see that very often with obesity. When obesity is an intermediate step, you need to submit a statement with your claim that makes it very clear that I believe my mental health um, led to my obesity, to, the, to my emotional state and, and inability to exercise, you know, being lethargic and, and um, down and eating too much or whatever. It caused your enabled your obesity. You need to make that clear for the writer. Draw that connection on paper, and then um, what that obesity caused. Because a lot of times people just put um, my back back pain secondary to mental health, and there's no understanding that obesity is the middle factor or the step stepping stone to the other condition. So when you when whatever your intent is with a secondary claim that doesn't have a nexus attached to it, make it clear in a statement, connect the dots for the raider, make it as plain as pie um, for them, what you are actually claiming or what you think this dairy or how it's connected, if it's that my right knee caused my left knee to hurt, overcompensation, write that out. Um, and that is how you get service connected, you know, how you get to an exam without a nexus. Now, at the exam, is up to it's the examiner's discretion on whether they agree that it's, it's caused or approximately due to or the result of. So, um, yeah, you've got to then prepare for the exam, but submit a statement with the condition and you shouldn't need a nexus, a detailed statement, not a generalized statement. Okay, here's Mr. Chris. The condition on the decision letter is the abdominal pain with this okay so you need to claim the hernia secondary um abdominal pain and hernia wouldn't be the same issue but it's the same body system and so if you um to, to um i need to look at the rating scale for that i don't it's not coming back to me at the top of my head i know what gerd gets rated but whichever one has the higher rating schedule a scale they might be in the same diagnostic code i could be thinking wrong if they are, then it's the same rating scale. But whichever has the higher possibility, you know, if hernia goes 10, 30, 50, and then abdominal pain and dysphagia goes 10, 20, you want to cl claim whatever, you know, focus on whatever would get you the heart, the step. So um, it looks like you would have to claim the hernia secondary to the abdominal pain, though. So I too, do think those are separate medical conditions although they would pyramid um, within a rating. So um, it needs to be a secondary claim would be the answer to your first question. All righty, guys. So last time I filed for an increase was in 2020, right before COVID hit. And it seemed like my claim was closed without an exam. Something ha was wrong then. I had a, a situation today where... Um, I filed for increase the same day, right after the, I saw that the claim had been denied on the same day. They had canceled the claim today because they said that the the um, the condition was still pending and, ha and hadn't been granted service connection when I filed for increase. So they canceled the claim, didn't mail the veteran any type of notice, and if I hadn't looked in the system, I wouldn't have seen it. Um, that it was canceled ever, and we would have just been waiting. And so there's some reason why you haven't gotten an exam, and it's three, it's three years later now. 
Um, there's some reason why you haven't gotten an exam and you need to investigate that. Get a representative to look into your file or, um, you know, call the VA, write the VA, ask for clarification on why your claim was closed without an exam. And you said it seemed like my claim was closed without an exam. Did they send a rating decision? Because if they sent a rating decision denying it, closed indicates to me that it was denied, it was it was closed, it wasn't denied. So when a claim is closed or canceled, sometimes there's no notice sent out. They're, they basically don't think it's a valid claim or a, it is a claim. There was some contradiction or, or reason why they didn't classify it as a claim. And um, like the situation I just told you, and um, it was canceled and closed. But if it was denied, that's a different situation. If they mailed you a rating decision, you need to read that rating decision well or get a representative to interpret it for you. What is the reason that it was denied? They tell you, or they sh it should be explained. Most times it's explained at least in a little detail, minimally, um, in the rating decision. And that's why you didn't get an exam. So you need to, if you have a written rating decision from that 2020 claim, you need to read that decision and find out what you need to do to overcome that denial. But if you don't have, um, uh, they never issued a rating decision on your claim in 2020, right before COVID hit. There's a problem. Something is something is wrong. That's all kinds of red flags. And so you need to um, pursue an answers on that. Might it be that you have an appeal pending for the condition at the BVA? That could be why they closed the claim or didn't process the claim because you can't have both at the same time. Uh, might it be that um, the wrong form was filled out and it, sometimes the VA doesn't notify you properly of reasons why, like they should, but if they sent you any type of notice or letter that explain why your claim closed without a, a, an exam or they gave you a denial, then you, know, you need to pay attention to that notice and go back to that notice for direction um, on why your claim for increase wasn't processed. But uh, most claims for increases get exams automatically. So this raises a ton of red flags um, on why you weren't given an exam. Um, literally, the manual, the M21 manual just changed on that last week and added, you know, another caveat. Um, but um, generally, before last week, you would get an exam if you put in a claim for increase automatically. So something... Something's not right there. There was either a wrong form or uh, some technical reason they couldn't process the claim, or they could have just screwed up. And if they just screwed up, you need to, uh, you know, make some noise about the error and get it corrected. All righty, guys, I'm going to take my last question here. Thank you all for joining me tonight and all that good stuff. Uh, but um, let's see. This is a good question to end with. Uh, Mr. Rod said, this is my second time. Going to a CMP exam for PTSD, is this normal? Um, yes, it's very normal, unfortunately, because it could be a situation where they need clear. The first examiner didn't give you an adequate exam. They didn't fill out the form, the DBQ form completely of the exam, or they said things that didn't make sense that weren't in your favor. So um, another exam means somebody looked at it. Usually means somebody looked at it and decided there wasn't enough to deny at least, you know, it wasn't just a denial situation, that they needed some type of clarification or more information in order to decide your claim. And so um, at least they didn't deny it. I'd rather go to a second exam than go through a denial. Let's put it that way. You see what I'm saying? I'd rather have another opportunity to, to tell my story and have somebody look at the evidence than have received the denial in the mail. So whatever they're sending you uh, to another exam for, um, you you want to focus on you want to focus on um, if it's service connection or if it's service connection you're seeking, you're not service connected right now. You want to focus on telling your story and the facts of the file um, and how it's connected to um, what you're experiencing today. Um, or if it's increase you're seeking, you want to focus on the severity of the condition. I wouldn't focus so much on why you're going to a second exam, even though it may not seem right. It is probably uh, more good than bad. 
Um, but even though it may not seem right, I will focus on preparing for the exam rather than wondering why you're going to it. You see what I'm saying? Use your time on what's most beneficial to you. And that's preparing for that exam, watching YouTube on the CMP exams, going to these groups and other things, you know, online, um, ask, asking your representative, you know, what, what can I do to maximize my time during the exam, convey my, uh, my condition in a compelling way that gets the proper rating and, um, you know, highlight and, you know, the facts of the file that of the situation that caused my trauma. So, um, yes, that is a, um, a second exam might not be a bad thing. I would think about it like that. So, um, all righty guys, thank you so much for joining me. I covered some good ground tonight. I hope that's helpful to you and benefits your claims. Um, I'll be back next month, first of the month, probably at, uh, first Thursday of the month, 7 PM in February. Um, here, YouTube, Facebook, uh, I think I'm on, um, Twitter tonight too. And somewhere else, um, not Instagram. I can't remember where I'm at, but, um, I'm a lot of places. I'm, I'm broadcasting a lot of places right now. Actually, I'm just on Facebook. Oh, here it goes. I'm just on Facebook and YouTube. Okay. But, um, uh, thank y'all for joining me. I'll be on Facebook and YouTube next month. Um, probably Twitter too. And, um, I'll be back taking questions. So, um, y'all have a wonderful month and, um, I wish you the best for your claims and I'll be praying for you. Y'all take care.